Number 10, the wolf dog. Heading back to prehistoric times, the wolf dog is an incredible, terrifying hybrid. It's the result of crossbreeding between domestic dogs and, you guessed it, wolves. This unique mix has existed since prehistoric times with early humans domesticating wolves thousands of years ago. Now the wolf dog still maintains a stronger connection to its wild origins than most domesticated dogs. Historically, these hybrids were prized for their hunting skills, sharp senses, and loyalty in battle or in guarding. Sounds like the ideal pet, my gosh. Even today, some people are fascinated by wolf dogs and attempt to keep them as pets, although their care requires specific expertise due to their unpredictable predictable nature. Yeah, a dog with unpredictable nature. What can go wrong, folks? Number nine, the Cheeto Cat. Not to be confused with him, although he's pretty cool. In 2001, Carol Dryman introduced the world to the Cheeto Cat, an exotic hybrid created by crossing a Bengal cat with an Asa cat. The goal was to capture the wild beauty of a cheetah in a domestic pet. Because wouldn't that be ideal? Wouldn't that be cool to have that? And surprisingly, it worked. The Cheeto Cat is muscular, playful, and highly energetic, with a distinctive spotted coat resembling its wild counterpart. These cats are known for their intelligence and social nature, often bonding strongly with their human owners. Now, despite their popularity, their creation of designer pets like the Cheeto raises important questions about the ethical implications of animal breeding purely for aesthetics. Yeah, you can't just make animals because you want to be cool, right? Maudie the Elephant. Maudie, born in 1978 at the Chester Zoo, was a rare crossbreed between an African and an Asian elephant. Two species that generally don't interbreed in the wild due to their different habitats and behaviors. This is already feeling like Jurassic Park. His birth was a landmark moment for animal science, offering researchers this unique glimpse into the possibilities and also the challenges of hybrid creations. Now, unfortunately, Mahdi only lived for a few days, but his existence sparked interest in the genetics of these two majestic species. Right now, we're trying to bring mammoths back to life, so this could be the key right here. Understanding hybrid elephants could potentially aid in their conservation, especially as both African and Asian elephants are right now facing threats from habitat loss and poaching. Could be the key to their survival. Or we could make Jurassic Park. One of the two. Number seven, the parrot chiclet. The parrot chiclet was a vibrant and somewhat controversial hybrid fish. Yeah, you thought I was going to say bird, didn't you? Got ya. It was first bred in Taiwan during the 1980s, and it's known for its striking orange color and unusual mouth shape, which gives it a distinctive beak-like appearance, hence the name. While visually stunning, this hybrid fish has been criticized for the health problems that its genetic manipulation can cause. Its beak-like mouth makes it difficult for the fish to eat properly, raising, of course, ethical concerns about creating animals, again, just for aesthetics at the expense of their well-being. Should we continue to create hybrid animals if their well-being is compromised just because we want to see, I don't know, a cool beaked fish? Or are these hybrids just another form of artistic expression through genetics? Both. Both are terrible. Number six, the Iron Age pig. A pig with medieval armor. What is this guy going on about? The Iron Age pig is a hybrid between wild boars and domestic pigs. It was created in Europe during the 20th century as part of experimental archaeology. Now, the goal was to create the pigs that ancient humans would have interacted with, allowing researchers to better understand prehistoric farming and animal domestication. Yeah, bring back the medieval pigs. Let's do it. They're going to take over. These hybrids, huh, they're hardy, they're adaptable, and they can thrive in rough environments, much like their ancient counterparts. Yeah, they made it through the dark ages, so I think they're good now. In addition to academic research, the iron pigs are still bred today for historical reenactments and occasionally for special agricultural purposes. The Luck Jag is a crossbreed between a leopard and a jaguar. Nailed that. That's exactly what you thought. And it was first bred in captivity during the 1950s. These rare hybrids combine the sleek agility of leopards with the muscular strength of jaguars, resulting in a strikingly powerful and unique big cat. Very big cat. The Lep Jag's patterns, behavior, and builds have intrigued science for decades, though these hybrids are not commonly found today due to ethical concerns about breeding large predators in captivity. Yeah, we're trying to get rid of zoos. Meanwhile, some guys are like, let's make more animals. While they remain an oddity in the world of hybridization, some researchers believe that studying these hybrids, like the Lep Jag, could provide new insights into big cat conservation and genetics, because apparently, I'm allergic to cats personally. I'm a dog guy. What are you? Comment down below. Dogs. In 2006, a hunter in the Canadian Arctic made an incredible discovery. Also really scary. What a sh 
pants if I found this one. A grizzly polar bear hybrid. Oh boy, also known as the pizzly or the gruller bear, whatever sounds more fun to you. These hybrids have become more common in recent years as climate change drives grizzly and polar bear habitats closer and closer together. Exhibiting characteristics of both parents, the pizzly has the size and white fur of a polar bear, but the more aggressive nature and omnivore diet of a grizzly. So this thing's gonna take over the world. We're making the strongest bear possible. Scientists are eager to study these hybrids as they may offer important clues as to how animals will adapt to this rapidly changing climate that we live in. But could these hybrids represent nature's response to a warming world, or are they simply a rare anomaly brought on by environmental stress? The Jago is a crossbreed between a jaguar and a smaller wildcat like a leopard. And it was first bred in captivity during the 80s as part of this genetic experiment because back then, what else are you gonna do? These hybrids are known for their strikingly beautiful coats and robust physical strength. These traits that come from their powerful big cat parentage. That's what we want, that's what we love and what we admire. They offer scientists a unique opportunity to study the genetics of behavior of big cats, but this time in controlled environments until it breaks out and eats all of us. However, ethical concerns about breeding large predators for experimental purposes have limited the extent of these studies. I'm on the fence for this one. I want to see a cool cat, but I don't like the fact that it's just stuck in a box its whole life. You know what I mean? I'm here for science, but I'm also here for the furry friend. I don't like it. Interesting, but I don't like it. Number two, the Thule hybrid. In the 1990s, African cattle breeders began experimenting with crossbreeding indigenous Thule cattle with other breeds to create these hybrids that were more resilient to disease and able to thrive in harsh environments. Again, we're just making animals to better suit our needs. Love a, love a human being. These Thule hybrids are prized for their ability to withstand arid climates and produce high quality beef, making them an important asset to farmers in Southern Africa. It would solve a lot of problems, I'll admit that. Now as the global climate continues to change, hybrids like the Thule could become even more valuable in regions where farming conditions are tough and could get even worse. Could these hybrid cattle offer a solution to the growing problem of the food insecurity in a world facing climate change? Or will they remain just another agricultural experiment just stuck in a box somewhere and now on a list? Hopefully the first one. And finally, number one, the Zubron. The Zubron is a hybrid between European bison, also known as a Wissant, and domestic cattle. It was first bred in Poland in the 1970s as part of an effort to create a hardier, more disease-resistant breed. Now, Zubrons are larger, they're stronger, they're more badass, and more resilient than either of their parent species, making them ideal, of course, for labor-intensive tasks in these harsh climates. Although the Zubron never achieved widespread popularity, it remains a fascinating example of using hybridization to tackle agricultural challenges. Again, that's the goal. That's the main goal for most of these on this list. Could this massive hybrid have paved the way for future innovations in sustainable farming practices, or... It is simply a forgotten chapter in the history of animal breeding that we've talked about here on Bumblebee today. Number 10, the Pizzly Bear. The Pizzly Bear, also known as the Gruller Bear, how fun is that? This is a fascinating product of climate change. Yeah, not so great, but we're making new animals, so here's the positive side. As the Arctic ice melts and the habitats of polar bears and grizzly bears overlap, these two species have now begun to mate, creating, of course, a hybrid bear. Pizzly bears have the grizzly size and strength, but also now they have the polar bear's ability to survive in colder environments, so we're doomed. Bears are gonna take over the world. That's awesome. Scientists are watching this hybrid closely as it may be a sign of how animals are adapting to our changing world. This is very interesting. Pizzlies could potentially survive in climates where neither parent species could alone. Could this hybrid be nature's solution to a warming planet or is it a sign of deeper ecological crisis? I vote the first one, for sure. Number nine, the beefalo. These fun names, they have a lot of fun names for these guys. The beefalo. In the 1960s, ranchers in the United States began crossbreeding bison with domestic cattle. They did this to create the beefalo, a hybrid that aimed to combine the best traits of both animals. What could go wrong? The goal was to develop livestock that had the resilience of a bison, able to withstand harsh climates and rugged environments, along with, of course, a higher meat yield of cattle. That would be amazing. The beefalo was seen as a potential solution for the meat industry, providing more efficient livestock. However, there were some complications. There's always complications. Beefaloes were more difficult to 
manage. They would often escape in enclosures, just run off into the night, even mixing with other wild bison populations, which now caused an environmental concern. So while the beefalo is still bred today, it never quite replaced traditional cattle farming just yet. And I say yet because I have to ask, do you think hybrids like the beefalo could be part of the future of sustainable farming, or do they present too many challenges? I mean, he's gotta stop escaping his pen. That's probably a problem. Let's talk to him about that. Number eight, Zorse. The Zorse. Sounds so medieval and majestic. The Zorse is what happens when you cross, you guessed it, a zebra and a horse. And it's as wild as it sounds. Breeding between these two species began in the 1800s, particularly in Africa and Europe, where people were fascinated by the idea of combining the zebra's iconic stripes with the trainability of a horse. They're like, yeah, the horse is good, but what if it had stripes? Zorses inherit the zebra's toughness as well and resilience to diseases, making them hardy animals, if anything. But they also come with a bit of the zebra's wild side as well. Well, can't have a zebra without getting a little wild, okay? Let me tell you about these guys. Zorses are typically used for riding and work, though they can be more difficult to train than regular horses. Now what's fascinating is that like mules, Zorses are usually sterile, meaning that every generation has to be bred from scratch. Yeah, made in a laboratory. Could a Zorse ever become a mainstream alternative to horses? I sure hope not. I don't, we don't need stripes. Just keep the horses doing horse stuff. We don't need to customize their colors, all right? Let them be. Number seven, the Liger. If you've seen Napoleon Dynamite in the last, I don't know, 27 years, this one will ring a bell. Ligers are the incredible result of crossbreeding a male lion and a female tiger. And they've been bred in captivity since the early 19th century. Now these massive felines can grow up to twice the size of their parents, super scary, often weighing over 900 pounds. Ligers inherit the lion's social behavior and the tiger's love for water, creating a truly unique, terrifying creature. They are bred primarily in zoos and private collections, you know, all that shady stuff. As Lions and tigers don't naturally live in the same habitats, right? It doesn't happen anywhere else but in these labs. Now, despite their impressive size, ligers have some health challenges due to their hybrid nature. Yeah, you can't just introduce a new lung and then be like, oh, I feel good. No, something's gonna happen. The ethics of breeding ligers are hotly debated as some question the practice of creating hybrids solely for human curiosity, and that's a bit icky, which I agree. At least the other animals on this list, they wanna like fix climate change or do something, adapt. This one, they're like, yeah, let's just see what happens. Roll the dice. Not a fan. Number six, the Dizzo. Oh, that's weird. It says yak and cattle. That's probably like a yaddle or like a cack. No, that's why, that's probably why. The Dizzo. High up in the Himalayas, ancient Tibetan and Mongolian farmers created the Dizzo by crossbreeding yaks and domestic cattle. I guess cack didn't really roll off the tongue, so that's fair. Dizzos are stronger and more productive than either of their parents, which makes them perfect for work in these harsh mountain environments. Now these animals are used for everything from plowing fields to carrying goods over steep terrain. They can manage it all and their milk and meat are highly prized as well. They're kind of nailing it. Now what makes the Dizzo even more remarkable is its ability to thrive in high altitudes where other animals might struggle. However, like many hybrids, dizzos are often sterile, like I mentioned earlier, which means farmers have to continuously breed new ones. They can't just sustain themselves. Would you ever see a dizzo? I mean, it sounds like the least of our concerns so far on this list. Better than a striped zebra horse tiger thing. I don't even know what's going on over there. This one seems fun. Number five, lepin. A leopard plus the lion. This is what you get. In the early 1900s, Japanese zookeepers managed to crossbreed a male leopard and a lioness, resulting in the exotic Lepin, Lepin, Leopon, Lepin, Lepin, one of those. These hybrids are larger than leopards, but smaller than lions and have the body shape of a lion with beautiful spots of a leopard. Yeah, paint that picture. Lepins are agile climbers like leopards, but they also have some of the social characteristics of lions. Now, because lions and leopards don't live in the same areas naturally, lepins only exist, sadly, in captivity. This list is interesting, right? It's very science heavy, but when you hear about these animals that are just stuck in captivity, that's, that part sucks. A lot. They've been bred for study and as attractions in zoos. That's it, right? They're not free to go. Though visually stunning, these hybrids do raise questions about whether crossbreeding for the sake of novelty is even ethical in the first place. Would you want to see more lepins in zoos or would you want to see less zoos in general? Comment down below. I want to see how you feel about hybrids and zoos and just the whole thing in general. Personally, I don't think we should f with any animal, but. Here we are. Let's continue on with the mule, one of the most well-known and successful animal hybrids of all time. Mules, which are the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse, have been bred for thousands of years. Evidence of mule breeding dates back to ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, where they were valued for their strength, endurance, and their ability to work long hours. These guys are OG, they go way back. Mules combine the horse's size and speed with the donkey's durability, making them ideal for farming, heavy labor, and transportation, right? They nailed it right across the board. Now, 
Now, despite their usefulness, mules are sterile, which means new ones have to be bred every time, which is exhausting, I bet. Interestingly, mules were also prized for their intelligence and calm demeanor. Yeah, why do you think mules became so essential to ancient civilizations? Could they have played a bigger role in shaping these early economies? Did a mule build the pyramid? Did we just figure it out? Number three, Savannah cat. In the 1980s, breeders in the US took on the challenge of crossing a wild African cat with a domestic cat, right? getting all catty up in here. The result was the Savannah cat, a beautiful, large, and sleek hybrid with the exotic appearance of a wild animal, but the temperament of a pet. Coolest pet ever or an accident waiting to happen? These cats are known for their loyalty and often behave more like dogs, if anything, following their owners around and playing fetch, all that fun stuff. However, they can also be unpredictable thanks to their other half, their wild heritage. Now, Savannah cats require more care and space than the average house cat, of course, and their ownership is restricted in some places. Would you ever consider owning a part wild animal or does the idea of having a pet with wild instincts sound like too much to handle? I've seen enough Tiger King to know your answer. Let's move on. Number two, the wolfin. A whale plus a dolphin. What do you get? A fun word, a wolfin. Sounds like a burger, like a whopper, like a wolfin. What is that? In 1985, a rare and surprising hybrid was born at Sea Life Park in Hawaii. Yeah, imagine going there and you're like, oh, we have a new animal today. How fun is that? Enjoy. This animal is a cross between a bottlenose dolphin and a false killer whale, which is a large species of dolphin. Now, wolfins are extremely rare, but they are known for their intelligence and speed, combining both traits from their parent species. Now, what's fascinating is that wolfins inherit a mixture of both whale and dolphin characteristics, but they're capable of incredible performances in aquatic shows, which is sad to hear, but they are smart. However, breeding these hybrids in captivity does raise questions about the ethics of creating these hybrids just for the purpose of entertainment. You know what I mean? Like we're trying to get rid of these sea worlds all around the world. We're not trying to make new animals in these parks. We're going backwards now. Could the wolfin become a symbol of our fascination with crossing species, or is it a step towards a deeper understanding of marine life? Yeah. Sea world. Let's move on. Number one, koi dog. The coyote and dog. The koi dog is very koi, this dog, absolutely. Koi dogs are hybrids between domestic dogs and coyotes, and they've existed for centuries, right? Native American tribes are believed to have encountered and possibly bred koi dogs a long, long time ago. Now, koi dogs are known for being intelligent and adaptable, but they can also inherit the wild instincts of coyotes, making them more difficult to train than regular dogs. Yeah, imagine training a coyote. No, thank you. I'm good. I'm all set. They're still found in some areas where coyotes and domestic dogs cross paths. Of course, that's bound to happen. Koi dogs have sparked debates about the domestication of wild animals and whether they can truly coexist as pets. I'm a firm believer in no, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that, let the animal go. All right. Could koi dogs represent a step towards future hybridization of pets or are they a reminder of the challenges in blending wildlife and domestic species? It's just a bad idea. Like stop breeding animals. Let things happen by themselves. We don't need a striped koi dog wolfin hybrid. We don't need that. This is in Jurassic Park, all right? Step into the Roman Empire around 100 CE, where a sinister twist to animal crossbreeding took place. This one was really bad. Romans were known, of course, for their elaborate gladiatorial games, massive events, and of course, they experimented with crossbreeding with different large predators, specifically for the arena battles. That's right, they bred lions with tigers, creating hybrids known as ligers, you guessed it, that were used in gladiatorial contests. Yeah, you have to battle and fight an animal that doesn't even exist. Good luck, we're playing God. The resulting creatures were of course terrifying in or out of battle, combining the ferocity of both species. Now how did these monstrous hybrids affect the spectators' views on these crazy events? Did the Romans see them as a triumph of human ingenuity or a grotesque display of power? I'm betting they went, yeah, fight, and that's all they went, probably it. Chinese dragon hybrids. In ancient China, around 500 CE, a particularly eerie form of animal crossbreeding emerged. This one's got Game of Thrones written all over it. Scholars attempted to create hybrid creatures that resembled the mythical dragons of Chinese folklore. They tried to make dragons. Are you kidding me? What are we doing? They crossbred various large reptiles such as lizards and snakes, hoping praying to capture the dragon's mythical traits. Can you imagine that? What if it worked? They're like, oh my God, run. The result was a disturbing array of hybrid creatures with dragon-like features, but often grotesque and fearsome appearances. Wasn't exactly a dragon, 
but definitely was not not a dragon. How do these hybrids fit into Chinese mythology? Are all those dragon paintings real? Did they nail it? Did they stir a mix of awe and dread? Comment down below all your thoughts about dragons. Do you want a dragon? I don't want a dragon, that's too much work. Imagine picking up the poop for a dragon. My back's hurting thinking about it. Travel back to ancient Egypt now, around 2000 BC, a very long time ago, when priests and farmers were experimenting with hybrid animals for mystical and also practical purposes. Picture them crossbreeding domestic cattle with wild Urochs to create more resilient and larger cattle. We need bigger cattle, now. These hybrids were not only used in agriculture, but were also believed to hold sacred significance. Imagine the chilling rituals performed just to ensure these hybrids brought both prosperity and divine favor, and you know, didn't decide just to eat us all instead. How did these ancient Egyptians view these creations? Was this a Dr. Frankenstein type deal? Were they like, oh no, or was it reverence, or was it fear? My bet is fear. Number seven, medieval beasts. In medieval Europe, around the 12th century, some scholars dabbled in disturbing crossbreeding experiments driven by a mix of curiosity and, of course, given the times, superstition. That was that was most of it. One particularly unsettling practice involved crossbreeding domestic pigs with wild boars. We need a piggier pig. Let's go. This created hybrids known as boar pigs, which in my opinion, a little uncreative. Could have called it a dragon or something. And they were both prized for their meat and feared for their aggression. These hybrids were bred to enhance traits for hunting and consumption, but their violent tendencies often led to horrifying accidents. Yeah, of course, you make a new crazy animal and you're like, oh, it's not friendly. No, neither are you, what are you doing? Imagine the fear these creatures instilled in medieval hunters. I mean, it's medieval times and now it's getting even worse. Good game, folks. We now travel to the Aztec Empire around 1500 CE, where the practice of creating terrifying hybrids took on a very, very dark twist. And that's coming from the Aztecs, okay? So buckle in. The Aztecs were known for their ritualistic practices and experiments with crossbreeding animals. One gruesome example involved the mixing of jaguars with pumas to create fearsome hybrids used in ceremonial rituals. A paguar. A Juma. I can't say a Juma, definitely can't say that one. Maybe that's why they didn't make a name for this. These hybrids with their combined ferocity were believed to possess supernatural powers. Imagine the chilling ceremonies where these chimeras were paraded before the gods. What must you have thought? Did these creatures embody the Aztecs' desire for control over the natural world? Or were they simply and only a tool of intimidation? Our journey now takes us to Babylon around 1800 BCE. Here, sheep were vital for both wool and meat, right? Definitely need both of those to survive, Babylonian farmers began crossbreeding different sheep breeds to get better wool and of course, more meat. They mixed sheep with fine wool with ones that grew bigger. So of course, that should work, right? Right? Why go through all of this trouble? High quality wool was a huge trade commodity and meat was essential for meals. So sounds like an amazing plan. This one didn't get too crazy. This one they kind of nailed and it was okay. But imagine the excitement as these early farmers improved their flocks, creating sheep that were not just more productive, but also economically valuable. You just made more food. It's like, hey, we didn't make a dragon, but we're not nearly as hungry. New sheep. Roman horse breeding. Let's gallop now to the Roman Empire around 100 CE, where Roman breeders were all about creating the ultimate cavalry horses. They crossed sturdy Iberian horses with speedy Eastern breeds to produce more powerful and agile steeds. Why? Why would they do all this? Well, because these improved horses were crucial for military campaigns and of course travel across the empire. It's not a small empire, I'll tell you that. Picture these horses in action, making a real difference in battles and transportation. That is huge. That is a major step for the Roman Empire. The better horses meant stronger cavalry and faster, more efficient communication across the vast Roman world. Yeah, didn't have a blackberry back then. Can't just be like, be there in 10, bye. No, you need a fast new horse. Mesopotamian Griffin hybrids. Imagine ancient Mesopotamia around 2500 BCE, a very, very long time ago, where myth and reality were intertwined. The Mesopotamians were fascinated by mythical creatures, particularly the griffin, which is a beast with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. So the scariest thing that you can imagine. Some early scientists and magicians, believe it or not, they experimented with crossbreeding lions and eagles, hoping to create real life griffins. Now the resulting hybrids were fearsome and exotic, often paraded in rituals or used as symbols of power because, well, what I just described, pretty powerful. A lion with wings? 
Can't beat that. So how did these hybrid creatures influence Mesopotamian art and culture? Did they serve as a bridge between mythology and reality, or did they evoke a deep sense of the uncanny? Probably a little bit of all of the above. Indian elephant hybrids in ancient India. All right, around 500 CE, there were reports of attempts to crossbreed elephants with other large animals like buffaloes, all to create hybrid beasts with unique traits. Yeah, traits to stomp the enemy away. That's pretty much what we're looking for here. These experiments were driven by the desire to produce elephants with enhanced strength or specialized characteristics for ceremonial purposes. Yeah, let's make the elephants stronger. Why not? The hybrids, often grotesque in appearance, were all used in grand processions and rituals. Imagine the awe and unease at the same time that these creatures inspired among onlookers. I wouldn't watch that parade at all. If I did, I'd stand 50 yards back because that is a terrifying creature. And number one, Byzantine camel hybrids. In the Byzantine Empire around 600 CE, there were attempts to crossbreed camels with other large desert animals like horses or donkeys, all to create hybrids suited for both riding and carrying many heavy goods. These experiments were aimed at improving efficiency in harsh desert environments, because that's a struggle, obviously. But the resulting creatures, with their strange mix of camel and horse features, they were both fascinating and disgusting to look at. Yeah, they were terrifying beasts. Picture these hybrids navigating the deserts. Also, so scary. The deserts of the Byzantium, how did these unusual animals impact trade and travel in that empire? Did they symbolize the empire's ingenuity or did they highlight a more unsettling aspect and approach of animal manipulation and crossbreeding?